Good day. In this programme, I'm going to discuss a topic which is somewhat outside my range, which is Russian weapons developments. Now, I say outside my range because I'm not a scientist or an engineer and I'm not a military person. And that hardly that means that I'm hardly the most qualified person to discuss these sort of topics. I nonetheless do so because, in my opinion, they are intimately connected to the recent steps which the United States is doing to open up some kind of dialogue with Russia and to achieve de-escalation with that country. Russian-US relations have been on a downward spiral now for a long time. In my opinion, the reasons for that are twofold. US expansion of NATO, not just into Eastern Europe, but into the territories of the former Soviet Union, a matter enormously sensitive to Russia and which the Russians see as impinging directly upon their national security and US interference in Russian internal affairs through its democracy promotion programs which it conducts in Russia. Now, I know that is controversial, but in my opinion, this is the driving force to the recent escalation intentions, or rather the long-standing escalation intentions, which over the last few months has reached fever pitch, uh, resulting in a possible uh, um, standoff in Ukraine following the deployment of Ukrainian forces to the conflict line in eastern Ukraine, separating Ukraine from the two breakaway republics of the Donbass and the massive Russian counter-response with Russia's mobilisation and deployment of hundreds of thousands of Russian troops along the Ukrainian border. Anyway, so much for that. I think that overriding all of these other factors is a growing awareness and alarm in the United States of a shift in the strategic balance of power. Now, the overriding cause of that, as I've discussed in many programmes for this channel, is the growth of Chinese power and China's alliance with Russia. This has created an enormous crisis for the United States in, the, in terms of the shift in the balance of power in the Pacific region, where the United States finds itself in confrontation with China and, uh, and the enormous Chinese naval build-up there. What I think gets less attention, but which I suspect is equally important, is the growth of Russian naval power in the North Atlantic, and possibly in the Pacific as well. This creates for the United States what you might call a two-front challenge, facing off against Russia in Europe and the North Atlantic, at the same time that the United States faces off against China in the Pacific. And it is these Russian military technological developments that I think may be causing particular concern and which may be driving some of the urgency that we're now starting to see in Washington. Now, I'm going to discuss these weapons developments in a moment, but I'm going to say, first of all, that we first learnt about them, or rather the international media first learnt about them, as a result of a speech which Russian President Putin made way back in the first half of 2018, in which he announced various new weapons systems that the Russians were busy producing and putting into service. Now, at that time, the commentary in the West, and especially in the United States, 
was to poo-poo many of Putin's comments. Most of them were seen as exaggerated. Some of the weapon systems that he announced were seen as uh, far-fetched or even futuristic. And it's probably fair to say that what Putin said at that time was not taken entirely seriously. I think what has changed is that some of these weapon systems are now coming to fruition and it's becoming increasingly clear that uh, Putin was not talking futuristically at all, but was talking about actual military programs which are now maturing. Now, some of these we already know about and the two which perhaps have attracted the greatest international media attention are the Russian Sarmat heavy ICBM, which is apparently due to enter service next year and which is completing tests this year, and the avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicle. Now, these are technologies that the United States is familiar with and up to a certain point understands. Uh, Russia has been a major uh, um, um, designer and builder of heavy ICBMs like the Sarmat, going back all the way to the 1960s. So though the Sarmat is apparently the most powerful and sophisticated ICBM um, in this series, and probably the most powerful ICBM ever deployed, it is not, from a US point of view, an entire surprise. The hypersonic glide vehicle, the avant-garde, is perhaps more of a surprise, but it's fair to say that the United States does have, um, does have programs to deploy such vehicles itself. And again, this may not have come as a total surprise. By the way, China also is developing hypersonic glide vehicles also. Though for the moment, these seem to have tactical rather than strategic implications. I think the two weapon systems that the United States ultimately was most concerned about, about uh, amongst the ones that Putin discussed in 2018, but also was most sceptical about, are two completely different vehicles. One is the Borestvenik nuclear-powered cruise missile, and the other, and perhaps the most serious one, and most, from the US point of view, alarming one, is the uh, Poseidon nuclear-powered drone. Now, before I discuss these two systems, and in particular Poseidon, which, in my opinion, is the major strategic game changer, I'm going to say something else about two other hypersonic systems that the Russians have either deployed or, or are in the course of deploying, which are also, I think, causing growing concern to the United States. Now, in a recent live stream that we did for the Duran, one of our uh, viewers... Uh, Simon, discussed Chinese naval developments and mentioned at considerable length a Chinese land-based ballistic missile system, which is clearly intended to strike against US aircraft carriers. The, unit, the Russians have never deployed a comparable land-based system, even though they have the technology to do so. And the reason for that, I suspect is because until fairly recently, the range of, of Russian land-based um, ballistic missile systems that did not have intercontinental ranges was limited by the, in, the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, agreed by the Soviet Union and the United States in the late 1980s. The United States has recently pulled out of that treaty 
So those restrictions on Russian developments of uh, um, medium-ranged ballistic missiles, which could have been launched, uh, ground-launched, and could have been used to strike against aircraft carriers, um, um, that those restrictions don't exist anymore. But it seems that the Russians, at the time when those restrictions were already in place, began to take steps to develop an analogous capability to the one possessed by the Chinese, but making it air-launched. Briefly, they redesigned their Iskander, their very advanced Iskander uh, um, ballistic, land-based ballistic missile system, into an air-launched vehicle, deployed it on the MiG-31 fight supersonic or indeed trisonic fighter bomber, and gave themselves, a, in effect, a hypersonic um, anti-carrier capability comparable to the one the Chinese have with their long-range ballistic missiles, which they launch from the Chinese mainland. This system, uh, this adapted Iskander system, is called the Kinjal. It has been demonstrated by the Russians and is apparently in active deployment and is causing the United States a great deal of concern. However, even more worrying, I suspect, for the US is an entirely different system that the Russians are deploying, which is a long-range, very long-range, hypersonic cruise missile, which is clearly intended to have an anti-ship capability. This system is known as Tsirkon, and a great very little is actually known about it, except that the Russians have been carrying out numerous tests and are in a position, are intending to deploy it on their cruise missile submarines of the Yasen class and on their Gorshkov class frigates. It will probably also receive some sort of land-based application also. The United States, again, was, I think, sceptical for a long time that Circon would enter service in any quantity or would indeed be a successful programme. But it's now clear that it is successful and it seems that it is going to be entering service fairly soon. Now, the reason that Circon is a game changer is not just the fact that it is hypersonic, but, because, but the fact that it is a cruise missile. The United States apparently does have, in its certain of its Aegis destroyer, destroyers, of the, uh, a capability to shoot down ballistic missiles which are being operated in an anti-ship mode. That would provide the United States some counter both to the Chinese land-based anti-carrier ballistic missiles and probably the Russian Kinjal system, which is also, as I've said, derived from a land-based ballistic missile, the Iskander. But these Aegis missiles deployed on these Arleigh Burke destroyers are not adapted to countering hypersonic long-range cruise missiles like Zircon. And it seems that developing a weapon system capable of countering hypersonic cruise missiles um, requires a whole range of challenges, which for the moment the United States um, is not in a position, it seems, to do. So Tsirkon, at least for a while, probably 10 or so years, is going to provide a deadly threat to U.S. naval capabilities. And from the U.S. point of view, the alarming fact about it is that it is coming into service very soon, probably next year, and has been successfully tested now, both from surface warships of the Gorshkov class and from submarines of the Yasen class. 
However, it is the two strategic systems, the Burestvenic um, nuclear-powered cruise missile and the Poseidon nuclear-powered drone, which probably are more concerning to the United States, again, because they pose challenges to the United States, which the United States doesn't really have at the moment a counter to. Now, I have to say something about these systems, which is that the technologies involved are obviously incredibly challenging. And this is presumably why the United States, for a long time, discounted the possibility that these two weapon systems would ever come into service in any foreseeable future. They're both, in a sense, futuristic. And what makes them futuristic is that both of them have a nuclear-powered motor. Now, there have been various attempts at various times to install nuclear-powered motors on aircraft and on cruise missiles. The United States experimented in doing, with, in doing, in creating a nuclear-powered cruise missile in the early 1960s. But all of these experiments up to now have been unsuccessful. It's been very difficult to miniaturize nuclear motors to the point where they are viable as power units for uh, drones and cruise missiles, and also to provide these um, nuclear powered unit, nuclear power units with the necessary shielding to make them safe to those who deploy these weapon systems. I suspect it was because the United States doubted that the Russians would be able to develop this technology that they didn't take the threat of these two weapon systems entirely seriously. However, it seems that the Russians may have cracked this particular nut. I say that because though we've heard very little about the Burestvenik super, uh, uh, nuclear-powered cruise missile, it seems that what is perhaps the more dangerous, from a US point of view, nuclear-powered submarine drone, the Poseidon, is now likely to come into service uh, and do so fairly soon, perhaps within a framework of about five years. Now, I would add at this point that one of Russia's major technological and industrial companies is the state-owned Rosatom Corporation, which is widely accepted as being today the world leader in nuclear power engineering. So perhaps if it is indeed possible to develop nuclear motors of this sort, it's not entirely surprising that it's the Russians who have been the first to develop them. But that's all we really know about them, the fact that they have been developed and that they do apparently exist. Now, there's some speculation about these two systems and there was an accident about two years ago um, involving some kind of um, m um, rocket engine or cruise missile engine which used nuclear fuel, which some people thought might be connected to the Burestvenik cruise missile, about which we've heard rather little recently. I ought to say that engineering engineers, who I take very seriously for their opinions, actually question whether the nature of the engine that um, had that malfunction and caused that accident really is the sort of nuclear reactor type engine that the powers the Burestvenik. They suggest that they suggested that it is in fact uh, it was an entirely different program that was affected. But we've heard little about the Burestvenik cruise missile. My guess is probably because from a Russian point of view, it is the less potent and the less effective system. 
The reason is that a nuclear-powered cruise missile is relatively easy to detect and therefore relatively easy to shoot down. By contrast, a nuclear-powered submarine drone poses what are for the moment enormous problems. There is only a limited extent to which any of the great powers can really track what goes on under the sea, particularly in the very lower depths of the world's oceans. So a nuclear-powered drone launched from Russia or from Russian submarines close to Russia could, in theory, with its nuclear engine, having an unlimited range, be able to creep up to the United States very stealthily and be undetected. It would be very difficult to intercept, and at the moment it seems that the United States may lack the capability either to track these systems or to destroy them in the event that it ever does in fact find them. So Poseidon is, in that respect, an especially dangerous system. It also comes with a particular threat, which the Burestvenic super, uh, nuclear-powered cruise missile does not have. Now, here we have to say that we are entering very much into the realm of speculation. But there are rumours that the Poseidon drone carries an exceptionally powerful nuclear warhead, perhaps up to 100 megatons, which would be twice as powerful as the largest uh, uh, nuclear warhead ever tested up to now, one that was tested by the Soviet Union in the early 1960s, which, had, uh, uh, which was uh, of only 57 megaton power, and which is called the Tsar, which was called by the Russians the Tsar bomb. So this would be an enormously powerful warhead. And the concern is that the plan, the Russian plan, is to launch these drones against the US coast, against US coastal cities like New York, Los Angeles. San Francisco and the rest, detonate them, create a massive tsunami effect and contaminate the entire coast of the United States where most of the, much of the US population lives, contaminating that coast with radioactive material and causing tremendous devastation. These sound, look to be, from the description, utterly terrifying weapons. The other thing that makes them especially alarming is that, of course, as well as their warheads, they are nuclear-powered. Their engines are nuclear-powered. Now, if this is correct, that opens up some rather disturbing possibilities. It could be, since they are apparently drones, this is dispute. What I'm going to say, I understand, is strongly disputed. But it could be that they could be launched from, by a submarine close to the Russian coast. They could then deploy, say, to the mid Atlantic or to the mid Pacific, remain there on station for a certain period of time, and then perhaps be activated in some way that we can't imagine, as a result of a signal from Moscow and launched against the United States. I take it and I assume that these deployments would not be permanent deployments, assuming that these systems, these drones, are indeed capable of autonomous operation. But the mere fact of their deployment in that way especially if it were to become known in the United States, would, at a time of crisis, escalate tensions to almost inconceivable levels. At the very least, 
one would assume that the United States government would have to take steps to uh, to evacuate its coastal cities, which might cause tremendous disruption to the United States and set its economy into effective freefall. I cannot imagine any action that Russia might take in a time of crisis that the United States would see as more threatening. Now, of course, it may be that Poseidon doesn't work in that way. Perhaps it's not intended to operate autonomously. I know there are some people who question whether such a thing is theoretically possible, and there are also some people who say that even if it were possible, the dangers of a, a, a mistake or an error are so great that the Russians would probably not want to go there. Uh, but it seems to me that the mere fact of the deployment by the Russians of submarines known to be carrying these drones would in, the, would in itself be extremely alarming and would cause huge concern to the United States in a period of crisis. Just to give an, ex an example of what I mean, we all know that in April of this year, there were deployments by Ukraine of their forces to the contact line in eastern Ukraine, and there were major deployments by the Russians of their, strate uh, of their army along the Ukrainian border. That caused great dismay in Washington and amongst European capitals with urgent calls to de-escalate. And as I discussed in programmes that I did for my channel, there might even have been genuine, uh, genuine sense of panic taking hold, certainly amongst some Western capitals at that time, at the prospect of a war between the United States and uh, between Russia and the and Ukraine, the United States, as we know, became so concerned that it took the step of uh, um, reversing its plan to deploy warships to the Black Sea, because it was worried that such a move at such a time might escalate the situation out of control. Well. Just imagine if, during a comparable period of crisis, the Russians were to deploy Poseidon drones, either on their submarines or, even more menacingly, semi-autonomously, in the middle of the world's oceans. I have to say that I think that the panic that we saw over the course of April, would be on a completely different scale. If we go back further still to the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, perhaps the most dangerous moment in world affairs since the end of the Second World War, again, imagine if, in the middle of a crisis like that, the Russians were to deploy their drones, their nuclear-powered Poseidon drones, in, the, in a similar way. I think panic is probably an, an understated understatement, an inadequate description of the impact that such a thing would have. So it is highly likely that the United States is extremely worried about these things. Now, it discounted the prospect of their deployment and development until fairly recently. But a number of things have now happened which have clearly caused it to have a second view. The first is that the Russians have almost completed their infrastructure to deploy these drones. They have, they're due to, due to deploy fairly shortly the first submarine, the Belgorod, which is capable of operating and deploying these drones. The Belgorod will be the biggest submarine in the world 
when it is deployed. It is already the longest. At the moment, it is exceeded in size by the last remaining typhoon submarine that the Russian Navy still has in operation and which is a leftover from the Soviet period. But that submarine is shortly due to be uh, uh, laid up and dismantled, at which, pl at which point the Belgorod will be the biggest submarine deployed in the world. Now, the Belgorod is a remarkable and very interesting submarine, which is not, I think, well understood, because it appears to be one of its kind. It seems that it not only is able to launch these drones, but it will be able to carry submarines, uh, mini submarines of its own. And its, its true purpose is not fully understood in the West. However, it may be that one of its purposes is to retrieve and collect Poseidon drones, which are operating semi-autonomously, semi but then are recalled back at a time uh, when a crisis, an international crisis, has been in some way resolved. That might explain some of Belgorod's features, in which case it's possible that Poseidon is indeed intended to operate semi-autonomously or autonomously, as I have said. Anyway, alongside the Belgorod, which is, as I said, one of a kind, um, four or five other submarines of the so-called Khabarovsk class are also apparently in um, um, advanced development with the lead ship, the lead submarine of that class, Khabarovsk itself, likely to be deployed very shortly. There's also information from Russia that the ECH tests on Poseidon are going well and that Poseidon itself might be in a position to be deployed imminently. Now, we don't know what imminently exactly means, but there's been some suggestion that it will be it will take place. Full deployment of these submarine of these drones will take place at some point over the next five years. So, with Khabarovsk coming on into service fairly soon, with Belgorod also coming into service with capabilities that are not fully known or fully understood, and with reports that Poseidon is indeed a functioning system, one can understand why the United States is now very much concerned. And I think when the United States talks about the need to forge some form of st strategic stability, to bring relations with Russia onto a stable and predictable course, some people in the Pentagon must be having these systems, Poseidon, possibly Burestvenik also, in mind. From the US point of view, these are extremely worrying systems and they will want to be absolutely sure that if, assuming they exist, the Russians, they, they understand clearly the circumstances in which the Russians will deploy them. I suspect that these systems are so concerning to the U US that the US might even be prepared to make major compromises in terms of strategic weapon systems in order to try to persuade the Russians to desist from deploying them at all. I am going to guess that this is going to be an important topic of discussion, if not perhaps between Lavrov and Blinken. I'm not sure to what extent Blinken himself is a competent person to discuss these matters with, but certainly between the US and Russian militaries in the context 
of any future arms control negotiations which may be pending. For my part, I'm going to say this. I find the prospect of these deploy of the deployment of these weapon systems utterly terrifying. I remember a time not so long ago when the anti-nuclear war movement was one of the most powerful forces in the West. It astonishes me that it has so completely withered away and has, to all intents and purposes, effectively disappeared. In its absence, not only have tensions between the superpowers grown to extraordinary levels, but as we see, the Russians countering steps taken by the United States have been developing and, and are now close to deploying weapon systems of potentially terrifying capabilities. Not only do we need, it seems to me, realism from Washington about these weapon systems and an acknowledgement that this confrontation with Russia is becoming increasingly dangerous. We need a return to that peace activism that we once had in the United States and in Europe and which contributed so hugely and so importantly to bringing the Cold War, Cold War and the nuclear arms race for a time to an end. Thank you for joining me on this program. I look forward to you joining me in future programs on this channel. Please also check out our main channel where I do programs with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforu. Um, uh, please uh, also check us out on our various platforms, BitChute, Odyssey, SuperTube and Locals. Please also support us to the extent you feel able via Patreon, PayPal and Subscribestar. And please remember that we accept donations in all forms of currency, including the new electronic ones. Lastly, don't forget to check out our Discord server and go to our shop and get yourself the amazing things that you will find there. The uh, uh, magic mugs, the T-shirts, the sweatshirts, the hoodies and the wonderful hats. And thank you for joining me uh, for this video on this rather scary topic. And I look forward to you joining me again for future ones. Um, and have a wonderful day until then.